got that fuego, that fuego fire, fuego, fuego fire, fuego, 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 fuego fire, fuego. Came up from that bando, ayy, put it in work like Rambo. Ayy, tell them goons a letter. You know I got that fuego, that fuego So this morning, we're going to talk about prayer, right? Now, prayer for, for many of us is a familiar idea, right? Maybe we've seen it and heard it. Maybe we've experienced it and been a part of it. But one of the, one of the most common questions I get and have in ministry, right, has been like, how do you pray? Like, what, what is prayer? Like, it's this thing that I think we all can kind of like put our finger on, but sometimes I have a hard time explaining it to people, or maybe we feel like overwhelmed by the reality of prayer. Or maybe you're like me, it's, it's easier for me to pray in front of a group of people, but then when I get alone with God, sometimes I feel like I'm just this awkward middle school boy who can't use words right. Like that's how I honestly feel at times, right? And so I don't know where you're at with prayer this morning, but my hope is that you would have a clear understanding of what it is and realize it's available to you. Not for the, the Christian who's on the varsity team and you feel like you're on JV. No, like prayer is for you. And man, Jesus like literally answers the question, how do we pray? And so the Bible is just awesome, right? Because it never leaves us hanging on the most important issues. So if you're wondering today, how do I pray? God's not just like, well, try it and figure it out. No, he's like, I give, I'm going to give it to you. Like Jesus' own words, like you're in red, okay? So, so here, here it is, like that's what we're going to go after. But I want to just, before we kind of get into the how, I want to go after the what a little bit. So what is prayer? Uh, the most simple definition is this. Now, I, I want it to be somewhat lighthearted and weighty. I know that's a contradiction, Preachers can do that, okay? It's fine. Um, but, but check it out. Prayer is having a conversation with God. Having a conversation with God. Now, here's how I want that to be lighthearted. It's just having a conversation with God, right? You do that often, right? You have conversations with people all the time. My hope is that even on your way in here, you were having conversations, or that as you got in here, you had a conversation. So it's something, conversation. We do that all the time. But now, here's where I want it to get weighty. You're having a conversation with God. Like God, not, not just your friend, not just that person who, uh, it, you know, you, you've got some relation with and it's kind of lighthearted. No, it's God. Like you're talking with the one who spun the stars, the one who spoke things into existence, the one who's ruling and reigning over the, all things, the one who like uh, cheated death, who hopped in the grave and then hopped out. Like that God, that's who we're talking to. And so although it is simply a conversation with him, it's you're talking to someone who has a value and a worth and significance. And so I say that to us to say, like, know who we're talking to. And like, we have his ear. Like, he, he's not like so busy, he can't hear us. In fact, he's leaned in, he's dialed into us. But now the question is, are we having reverence and awe as we go to have a conversation with him? I love our statement of faith here at Zeal. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. Go to zealchurchyork.com and you can look at uh, who we are and then like what we believe. And in there we have some statements, just our theological statements on some issues and different doctrines and things like that. But I want to read for you the one that we have on prayer because this is really who uh, or what we believe about prayer as a church. It says this, we believe that prayer is how we communicate with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God supernaturally intercedes on, on behalf of our prayers as believers and makes it possible to approach him with confidence. So supernaturally, something's happening as we pray to God that allows for God to hear us and that leans us in, right? We can have confidence as we do that. We're not like, oh, God, if you're up there somewhere and you can hear me and it can get through these thick walls, then maybe if you're feeling like it, go for it. No, like we can go to the throne and say, no, God, like of heaven, the one who pleased your blood over me, I'm coming to you with some stuff. Do it. Like we can have that type of confidence because of God and, and what he's done for us in Jesus. Prayer is how we have a conversation with him. It requires, listen to this, both talking and listening to him. Have you ever been a part of a one-way conversation where you're like trying to interject a word, right? Like that can get really frustrating real quick. And maybe like sometimes we're talking and God's like, well, I got the answer. If you just be quiet for a second, I'll give it, right? <laughs> too busy talking and not doing enough listening. Sometimes the best prayer times, you don't say a word. 
Right? You're, you're just listening. You're, you're allowing the Spirit of God to, to reveal to you truth. We're going to talk about today that like God actually already knows what we need before we even ask. Right? So, so sometimes it just requires some listening. It's a two-way conversation. We are called to pray in accordance with the will of God, and He will hear us. Do you hear that? Like when we're praying in accordance to the will of God, He will hear us. That's, that's where the confidence piece comes in, right? Prayer demonstrates our dependence on God and our love for Him. So when you're praying, like even if you ask the question, well, if God's got it all together and He's sovereign and we talk about how awesome He is, why do I need to pray? Well, because it's expressing that you're dependent on Him. Like you need to do that and He delights in that. And number two, because you love Him. You love Him, right? And so if you love Him, you want to talk to Him. You want to tell him how life's going, or you want to ask him to help you out, or you just want to remind him of how awesome he is. Not that he needs your reminding, right? But, but it's an expression of where your heart really is. Jesus teaches us how to pray by giving us the Lord's Prayer. We're actually going to go there this morning. And in this, we learn that prayer consists of a few things. One, adoration. Two, confession. Three, thanksgiving. And four, supplication. I'm going to talk about what those mean in just a moment. Prayer is vital. If you, if you write nothing else down, write this. Prayer is vital to our spiritual lives because God moves in response to our prayers. In other words, like when we pray, God does stuff. When we pray, God moves. Now, sometimes the stuff is fixing you up on the inside and none of your circumstances externally change. Isn't that good though? Like that God wants to deal with the inside, not just the outside. Even when you, our prayers are somewhat short-sighted and we're like, God, just, just fix that person. That person's driving me nuts. You know what God's solution to that, to that might be? Just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overload you with patience. And that person's actually probably going to get a little more annoying. <laughs> or, or maybe he's actually going to deal with that person and he'll shut them up. Like, he can do both. But here's what I know he wants. He wants to deal with the inside, not just the out, right? Now, let's talk about those, those kind of four words that maybe for some of us we got it but didn't, and that's fine. The word adoration, I mean, you're just telling God how awesome he is. You're adoring him. God, you're awesome. God, you're faithful. God, you're beautiful. You see uh, tons of scripture that gives us, like, if, you, if you're like, how do I adore God? Well, there's tons of scripture. Go to the Psalms, right? David, there's a lot going on in the Psalms, but David's just like, God, you're awesome. Your works are great. You're, you're so mighty. You're going to destroy the enemy. You're going to smack him in the head. Like, you're going to, you know, all these things. You're just praising and adoring how awesome God is. That's what adoration means. Confession, right? That you're saying, God, I, I need you. Like, that's the first confession. God, I need you. But then maybe it leads to some confession of our sins, confession of a lie that we've been believing or a truth that we've been neglecting in our lives. But it's some sort of confession, right? And it doesn't always have to be a negative thing or even a heavy thing. Sometimes it's confessing like, Jesus, you've got this. Like, I don't. I feel like it's out of control, but Jesus, you've got this. That's a confession. It's a declaration, right? Then we have thanksgiving. This is an area, I think, in prayer that we, uh, maybe as a church, I actually think we do really well, but holistically as Christians, like we just, I think God would want us to grow in this a little bit, right? We can, in the midst of begging him for other things, we neglect everything he's done, right? Like we can be a little ignorant, if we're honest, and say like, God, you've done these 10 things, but I really just wish you would have done the one. It's like, well, let's take some time and thank him for the 10 and then go after the one. Like, we'll go there, but like, let's thank God for, for what he's done. And here's the reality, like when you actually offer up prayers of thanksgiving, what God does in that is he begins to shift your heart, shift your mind, shift your eyes. And so maybe some of the trivial things begin to melt away because they actually have met the face of God. Right? So, so that's what thanksgiving is. And then supplication. We ask for him to supply things. We ask for him to give us things. This is what we see in the Lord's Prayer. We say, give us, our, give us this day our daily bread, that he would be someone who's supplying. This is prayers on behalf of other people. God, help that person. God, heal that person. Deliver that person. Like, this is where we, like, lay hands on people and pray that God would heal them. Like, like we believe in that, right? And so, there's a level to which, like, prayer is all-encompassing. And so, a statement like this can make it seem big and audacious. And I think it should be. And yet, it's also very simple. It's a conversation with God. So, now, now that we know kind of the, the what... We're going to talk about the how. So Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 15, we're going to be there. If you want to turn there, it'll be sort of on the screen. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. So uh, this is a moment where Jesus is even with his disciples and he's teaching them all this stuff. And we're, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus is just literally dropping nuggets of truth and wisdom and revealing the kingdom of God like all over. I mean, it's literally the greatest sermon of all time is what we're in kind of the thick of here. 
And his disciples are like, okay, well, teach us how to pray. And it's interesting because Jesus actually starts with how not to pray. I don't know if I ever noticed that before, but this specific text in Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 15, Jesus doesn't go into right away the stereotypical Lord's Prayer that we know, our Father in heaven. He doesn't start there. He actually gives them two pretty significant warnings on what not to do. And then he goes in the, to the what to do. And so we're going to look this morning at some prayer don'ts and some prayer do's. Okay, don'ts and do's. We got two prayer don'ts and then uh, a few prayer do's. But here, here's what we see. Starting in verse 5, it says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. <laughs> like let that sink in for a moment, right? For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So the first prayer don't is this. Don't pray publicly until you pray privately. Yes. I, want to, I want to be very clear here. Don't hear me say don't pray publicly. But don't pray publicly until you pray publicly. Privately, I think sometimes we could hear that and say, like, okay, good, I'm off the hook. I don't have to pray in public. Actually, I think God would challenge all of us to do a little bit more of that, right? But it's, there's an order. He's saying, don't be like the hypocrites, because what the hypocrites do is they don't acknowledge me in private. They do their own stuff. They are so distant from me, and then they get in front of other people and just start spouting off all this religious nonsense. And it sounds spiritual. And it sounds like he knows me, but he, he's, he's far from me. In fact, God uh, is often accusing people, you're, you honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. Like God abhors that. <laughs> and so that's what he's saying. Don't be hypocritical in that way. Don't, don't diss me in private and then try to honor me in public. Like, it doesn't work that way. He even says, like, if that's how you want to roll, then you've gotten what you deserve, right? You've gotten uh, kind of your reward for that, which is like public acknowledgement. And I even think in that, it's, it's even public ridicule. Right? Because you, you have, have gotten the praise of man and it's fallen very short and it, it fills you up about that much to the point that you keep seeking it because it's not enough. You've gotten what you wanted. So then he says, go into private. Go into your room. Shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. Like, I think that's so interesting. And your father who sees it in secret will reward you. So here, here's a question for us to meditate on. Whose attention are you seeking in prayer? Whose attention are you seeking in prayer? Right, if it's, if it's publicly, specifically, right? Like, and I'm, like if, you've, if you're feeling convicted right now, you're not alone. You're not alone. That doesn't mean we should just wallow in our misery together, however, but you're not alone. Right, so there's a level to which we, we've probably all been somewhat guilty of, even just considering what are they going to think? I don't know enough words. Ooh, dang, that prayer was really, like, spiritual and, and like, awesome. Like, I just have to say like, Hey God, you're awesome. Thanks. Amen. So like, is that really worth saying out loud? Like, this is what it looks like for us to, whose attention are you seeking? It's sometimes it's masqueraded in false humility, which is pride. It's pride. And God hates that and wants to kill that in us. Right. And some of us, we just want to be seen by others. And so we'll get like, if there was an open mic time, we'd grab the mic and we wouldn't let it go. Right. That's clearly sinful. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> but some of us, it's, it's more of a, a hidden pride. And I think what the Lord is trying to help us see this morning is, is whose attention are you seeking, God or man's? Because whose you seek, you will find. He says that here. If you're seeking the attention of man, you'll get it. And it's, it's light, and, 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 and it doesn't really have any substance or weight to it, and it's going to die over time. In other words, pray for an audience of one. Pray for an audience of one. There's a level to which, even, even publicly, we have to be f so focused on the one person of God, right? Who, who's obviously Father, Son, and Spirit, but we're so focused on Him that like at the end of the day, we don't really care what other people are thinking about us. And I'm not saying that's easy to do. In fact, that's somewhat difficult to do, but it requires a gaze and a focus and attention on God and not anybody else. It's, it's, al it's really like allowing the Spirit to kind of like push everybody else to the fringes and us just get about God, right? And if we're all doing that, there's a beautiful unity there. But who is the audience in whom you're praying to? And then he says, if you don't, uh, or so he's talking about wanting uh, us to go to the secret place, right? To the hidden place, to the place where nobody's watching. Right? We've heard that definition of an integrity growing up, right? Integrity is who you are where no one else is looking. 
our prayer life is really what you're saying and how you're letting God speak to you when no one else is looking. Like that's true purity in prayer is when it's just you and him, how's that going? Like really, when it's just you and him. And if you're like me, then sometimes you're like, ooh, I don't even know the last time it was me and him. Well, well today can be your day, friend. Like it, it can be for you today where it's just you and him. But like God's not here to like bash you over the head. He's here to draw you near. Hey, I miss you. Hey, I really like that when it's just me and you. Like your, your personality's great. You don't want to know why? Because I made it. <laughs> I think you're pretty cool. And I like how you communicate to me. Even if it's stumbling and fumbling over your words, like I know your heart. So God's trying to woo us in and draw us into himself privately so that when we get together publicly, something, something can happen. You can lock arms together. Think about in warfare, right? Prayer is warfare. So if you've got a soldier who's not training on his own and you've got other soldiers that are, that one soldier is going to be the weakest link. And what we know the phrase, you're as strong as what? Your weakest link. And so even, once again, praying together publicly, if we're not all committed to doing that privately, it's not going to have as much weight and power as if we're all committed to doing it privately, right? Like that's what the Lord wants for us. It's for us to be so in tune with him individually that when we get together, we can sense his presence together. And right, like I think we've, we've tasted and seen that here, right? We're, we're, like I remember when someone here got saved, literally uh, right over there in that, that corner over there, literally uh, like six people were praying that God would save somebody. I'm like, well, somebody doesn't have a chance today. Like God's, God's going to get somebody. I don't know who. But man, it, like I'm just sitting back like, all right, God, which one? Like, who are you getting? Because, I kid you not, like five, six, seven people in a row were just praying, God, go after that person. And it's like, how does that happen? Well, because we're all in tune with the Spirit. And sure enough, boom, someone gave their life to Jesus that day. And it's because there's this unity happening because they're connecting with God privately so that publicly it begins to work. So what God wants us to pray publicly, but not until we do it privately. Will you go to God in the secret place? Will you get alone with Him? Will you connect with him intimately? Like getting one-on-one -on -one time with him, right? If, if we have a relationship with anybody, but, but especially like marriage or, or even kids, right? Like there's a level to which communal gathering is awesome, right? It's, it's fun. It's beautiful. It's like some of our favorite memories and moments, but it's so necessary that we get one-on-one -on -one time with the people we love. It's necessary. It's not just a, a, a kind of a good idea. It's, it's necessary for a relationship to thrive. So like me and my wife, right? Like I love hanging out with my whole family, but there's times where me and my wife just need to connect, right? Or me and just one of my daughters. Like I had a good time this Friday with just Kingsley and we watched the same like little five minute clip over and over and over. I'm like, are we done? Nope, over and over. And I tell you what, like I was in heaven. It was just one-on-one -on -one time with my sweet Kingsley and she was cuddling up and daddy again. Daddy played again. It's like, oh, I'm so tired of this, but I love you so much. Let's play it again. <laughs> One-on-one -on -one time is so necessary, but are you taking time with just you and the Lord? Because what, what can happen as we try to do stuff with God, or do stuff for God, we forget to do it with Him? And I'm preaching to myself, guys, but like, we can get so focused on what God has for us, and we go after it, and we go after it, and we go after it, and yet somehow God is left in the dust because we've tried to do it apart from Him. And so that one-on-one -on -one keeps our souls connected to the one whom has already connected us to Him, Right? And it says, like, I love it. There's, there's a promise here. Like, there's a promise you can hold on to. It says, the Father will reward you. You want to be rewarded by your dad? Who spun the stars? Who created giraffes and hippopotamuses? Right? Like, you want that God to be the one giving you a reward? I think so. And it says, if you seek him in the secret place, he will reward you. Now, with what? That's a, that's a good question. What? Himself. Himself. Like, let think about that. He... He, he may give you some other stuff, but it's nothing compared to himself. So if all you get out of your prayer time is just communion with God, you've gotten enough. You've gotten all you need. Everything else is just a little bit added on there. But what your soul needs to thrive and survive and to actually make an impact for this world is, is communion with him and nothing more. All right, the second don't. Don't pray if you don't mean it. Don't pray if you don't mean it. Don't pray it if you don't mean it. So look at verse 7. And when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So don't pray it if you don't mean it. And like, I want this to be somewhat like lifting a burden off of you. You don't have to do some sort of like religious chant, right? You, you don't have to like get all of the words right. Now I'm not 
giving an invitation for us to just start spouting off heresy or nonsense or false th stuff. I'm just saying, like, if your heart's not in it, don't go for it. Like, a few weeks ago, we even sang a, a song called Refiner. <laughs> that song, I think Crystal even mentioned, like, hey, if you're not there yet, don't sing it. It says, uh, Refiner, you're the fire, I want to be consumed. Think, think about that. I want to be consumed by a fire. Anybody, like, want to jump in a fire later today? <laughs> Anybody want to go to a bonfire? Just like, let me hop in that joint. Like, no. Like, <laughs> yeah, what you're inviting God to do is light you on fire. Now, it's biblical, it's right, it's good, it'll change you. However, if you're not there yet, like, don't, don't pray that yet. Say, God, I want to be there, but I'm not there yet. Get me there. Then I'll jump in, okay? But here, here's the beauty of God. He's very patient and kind and gracious with you. Far more than you deserve, far more than I deserve. And so if you're not there yet, he knows. Don't try to fool him. You can't. So stop fooling yourself. It's like, don't, don't pray if you don't mean it. That's what Jesus is saying here. Don't heap up empty phrases. Like, like there's constant scriptures where, where God just like, I'm so tired of y'all's empty heartedness. I'm tired of these sacrifices. They mean nothing to me. Because it's these people who are doing the right thing, but their heart is so distant. Like some of us maybe have been praying, praying empty prayers and God's like, I'm, I don't need that. Like I'm tired of that. You've got to be tired of that. aren't? Like I'm tired of it. Why don't you come to me with some heart? So, so here's some of the practicals here. Be serious about what you say and what you ask for. <laughs> and like understand that when you ask for certain things, God's going to give it to you and you may not even like how he does it, right? We said it already. God, just help me be more patient. You know what that means? Yeah, well, right. He's going to put you in situations where you need to be patient. <laughs> Have you ever prayed, God, give me patience and you just get stuck in traffic for hours? Like, come on. <laughs> Jesus, really? Or no, I prayed like, God, like help me love my family, love my kids. And then I come home and my kids are just, ah! like they're screaming at each other, right? It's like, okay, God, pray, I pray that you'd shut them up. Can I pray for that? Is that cool? Can you, you're a God of miracles, right? Let's go. <laughs> no, but like the, the reality is, right? Like we, when we pray for things, God, God wants to answer them, but he wants to answer them not to just check the box, but to actually get your soul right, to get you ready for heaven. Like we haven't even gotten in the actual thick of the Lord's Prayer, but we're praying that heaven would touch earth. That's what we're praying, okay? So, so be serious about what we pray. We approach with confidence, but you're still approaching a king. Like think about that. Like God says, like you can approach him with confidence. Like a, a child approaching their parents, right? Regardless of their status, they run in. No, doesn't matter what meeting's happening or what other uh, things are happening or going on. Like you as a kid can run to your dad's feet anytime you want. And yet you're still talking to a king. And so just realize that this morning, like there's a confidence you need to have, but a confidence not because you're just talking to your homeboy or talking to someone who has a listening ear, but you're talking to God, who's the king who sits on the throne and he ain't getting off. So, so approach with confidence, but be serious about what you're saying. In other words, in your prayers, don't let your lips write checks that your heart isn't ready to cash. Don't let your lips say things your heart isn't ready to follow up with. Almost again, God is patient and gracious with you. So the expectation isn't that you just give him lip service, but that you would give him heart cries. Like maybe, maybe some of why this morning you're feeling maybe stagnant in your prayer life is because you're just giving God some lip service. Like I've been there, right? I've been there. I'm just saying the right things. God, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, where are you at, God? Are, are you even hearing me? But then when I start to get real and honest and raw with God, and maybe even use some words I won't say here at church, if I'm just really honest with you, like, then I'm like, all right, God, I think you're there. And like, I'm not, I'm not endorsing you just kind of flippantly saying stuff to God, by the way. But I am saying that in that rawness, in that realness, in those moments, like when you're giving him your heart, like that's what God is pleased with, is your heart. Is you giving it all to him. And you can be real, honest, and raw because our Father knows what we need. Did you hear verse 8? Do not be like them. Don't be like those who give up empty phrases because... Your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is why you can mess up the words. This is why you can actually give your emotions to him. This is why sometimes the best prayer for you is just literally uncontrollable weeping. Because he knows what you need. Like this can actually bring some hope and some lightheartedness in your prayer life too. Because if you get to the end of your prayer and you say amen, and you're like, oh crap, I forgot that one thing. God knows your heart. He knows your heart. 
And by the way, the amen is not a period, it's a comma. Like, you can start back in that thing, okay? It's not like there's a timeline on your prayer, and like God's like, oh, you got the amen, and it doesn't count, right? You got to wait till the next time you get holy again, right? No, it's any time, any moment you can go to him with your heart. And he knows what you need even before you ask it. Isn't that amazing? That the God in whom we're, like, like we're pleading to, like, like we're getting, giving everything to, he already knows what we need. And check it out, need, not want. <laughs> Huge difference. And so God is too good to always give you what you want. I even think yesterday, my kids, one of my kids got a lollipop. Daddy, you're so mean, you never give me the lollipop. It's like, baby, you asked one time and I said no, because you just five minutes ago had a big cookie. She could put out one in. I was like, I'd be terrible if I just keep shoving sugar down your face, knowing you're about to go trick-or-treating tomorrow, right? Like, like there's a level, right, to which, like, as a good dad, I, I want good things for my kids, which sometimes meaning saying no. So God sometimes will say no, and that's okay. He, he has the ability and authority to do that. And by the way, he doesn't have to explain himself. Like, sometimes he will, but he doesn't have to. He's not obligated to give you an answer why he told you no. And that's just a good word for us to hear so that we're not like frustrated for no reason. A God who not only knows better than us, but wants better for us. So I hope that brings encouragement to you today. So now the prayer does. Now this is getting in the thick of what we may be familiar with with the Lord's Prayer. And then verse 9, it says this, pray then like this. I love that because Jesus is saying, this is what you do. This is how you pray. Like if we know, like... If we're followers of Jesus, when Jesus says, do something like this, we should actually perk up. We should actually pay attention. We should actually start taking notes, scribbling around there, trying to figure out what this means. So Jesus says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. First prayer do. Pray that God's name is glorified. There's kind of six things here smacked in this Lord's Prayer, and the first three are all about God all about him, that we get the bright perspective. But it says, pray then that God's name is glorified. That's what that statement means. Pray that uh, we would have the right view of God, that we'd have the right perspective of him. Look, look at how it starts. Our Father. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to this, but it really caught my eye this time walking through the Lord's Prayer. It's, um, it's, not, it, it, it's like communal. I'm blanking on the right like, vocabulary term for it, but it's not uh, God, I, like my Father, it's our Father. It's including every person who's a part of the faith. And so it's this act that we're doing this on behalf of others, not just for ourselves. And then it says, our Father. This is how we should view God. Scripture tells us even how, kind of a template, that we pray to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. To the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. Now, I think you have liberty to talk to Jesus and the Holy Spirit too, but there's a level to which Jesus is teaching us, like, we need to go to the Father. Go to the Father. And so we need to view God as Father. Now, for some of us, viewing God as Father is a difficult thing to do because maybe we've been hurt or abused or neglected by our own uh, earthly fathers. And so just a, a quick word on that, like the, God the Father is better and greater and more significant than your father here, including the ones who are killing it, who are doing really well. Like some of us are dads in the room and we're great, or we have dads in the room that are great. And yet going to our heavenly Father, there's something significant and weighty and even more in that. But we're going to him because he's provider. He knows what we need. He's good. He's strong. He's our protector. It's viewing him as one who has access to everything we need and then some. It's to see him as holy and to see his name as holy and worthy of worship. Sometimes when we uh, kind of lean into that idea of we have access and confidence, we can neglect the holy, holy, holy. Isaiah gets a vision, and in that vision, Isaiah sees God properly, and his response is very interesting. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, I'm dwelling amongst people of unclean lips, this is all messed up and jacked up, because you're so good. He, he, Isaiah's not in the wrong, Isaiah's in the right, and he's saying everything else is in the wrong, including me. So there's a level of having a perfect view of God, right, that actually begins to get our eyes gazed upon. He's holy. There's no one like him. Like, his name has power and authority. Like in the Hebrew, they were even, like they couldn't even say his name because of the significance and weight of it, right? We know that, we sing about it, there's power in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has the authority and ability to break chains and strongholds, to get dead things and get them back to life again. Yes. So it's seeing God as this type of holy. That's what Jesus is saying. Start your prayer with like viewing God in a holy, holy perspective. And so, so the way I like to think of it is this, like before I even ask him for anything, I just want to tell him how awesome he is. 
Tell him how great he is. Not, not just because of what he's done, but because of who he is. If he does nothing else for the rest of eternity, he's still this. Still awesome. Still worthy and holy. And so it's this idea that his name would be glorified. Well, what does it mean to be glorified? Well, glory, that word, is an interesting word. We talk about, like, there's statements, kind of uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, I think it says, like, the chief end of man. So the whole purpose of man or people is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So if that's really our purpose on life is to glorify God and to enjoy God's presence, we need to know what it means to glorify him. That word glory means weight, significance, power. That means to glorify God is to put, to put emphasis on him. To, to help people see how heavy and weighty and powerful and significant he is. It's really just helping people see more clearly what's already true. You and I don't have the ability to make God uh, uh, more awesome than he is. We have the ability to show the world how awesome he is, right? So we can pull back layers and uh, hold up mirrors and we can shine lights in areas and ways that help people see just how epic he's always been, regardless of how they viewed him. That's what it means to glorify him, that we would live in such a way that we actually uh, put significance and weight back on the name of God. If you think of how these spotlights are operating right now, if we were to turn them off, you wouldn't be able to see me and how gloriously sweaty and beautiful I am right now, right? You turn those off, you're going to have a limited perspective. You turn them on, you're not staring at the lights and saying, man, those lights are awesome. And you're looking at me. Yeah, we're supposed to be more like those lights than the person on the stage. God's at the center. He's the one who's getting all the attention. We're just the lights that shine on, on him to make him just more, more real, right? More, more seen to those who are looking. So we thank God that he is holy and that the world would respond accordingly. Right? So we're praying that, God, that, that people would actually see God for who he is and respond in accordance to who he really is. That's the first part. The second one is this. Pray that God's kingdom would be submitted to. Verse 10 says, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. We, may, we, may, we even pray this here all the time. Your kingdom come here, Lord, in York as it is in heaven. What does that mean, though? What does it mean? Well, it means that we would pray, praying that God's kingdom would be submitted to. Like, God's already king. Regardless of where his kingdom is, and the beauty is, is it transcends any culture, region, time period, even this earth. Like, his kingdom's kind of, like, all in and, and just everywhere. But it's submitting to his kingship. So your kingdom come means for us that we would relate to God as our loving leader. Like, like to really be a part of the kingdom means you acknowledge God as king. This is not a democracy we're a part of. It's a monarchy. He's the one. He calls the shots. We, we don't get a say in what he does. Now he loves us and wants us to play a significant part. And so he, he actually values our opinions and perspectives. However, they're all subject and submitted to him. That's the catch. So it's not just like fall in line and know your place and blah, 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 blah. No. It's a loving, uh, kind of intimate relationship we have with God, and yet the buck stops with him. And we know that, and we gladly submit to that. But it's that we would see him as our loving leader, the one who calls the shots, the one whom we bow down to. And so this means we gladly surrender our lives, plans, emotions, thoughts to him. And really in this prayer, we're praying that God would take over. Not pick sides, not just kind of like, hey, I'm over here, and if you want to join Team Jesus, come on. No, we're praying that God would show up and he would take over. Like, when we talk about York, uh, or seeing the kingdom come here in York, we're not just saying, hey, God, let's get some churches and some nice people here. No, we're saying that God would, through the power of the gospel, put light on darkness and that it would obliterate it, explode it, move it out of the way, destroy it, and let it be no more. That we'd come into places where uh, God has been robbed of his glory and we'd give it back. Places where strongholds and demonic forces have been having their way with the people of the city. And we say, no longer will we tolerate that. And we're going to go down swinging. Because the one who fought the devil already is one. And we're his kids. We don't like it when people mess with our dad. That, that's what we're talking about. So your kingdom come sounds eloquent and great. But we're talking about declaring war for the king against the enemy. And he doesn't like it. Our, our enemy doesn't like this. And so he's fine with us just praying your kingdom come if what that means is just being nice people in a church building. But I don't know about you, but I don't want to give my life to that. But this is what it looks like, that we'd pray that he would take over and that, and that we would gladly submit to him. I, I, I love this idea that like literally we're saying, God, you do with my life what you want because you know better for it than I do. 
I'm originally from Georgia. I've been here for 10 years now. I remember when I like, felt like the Lord was drawing me to Shrewsbury, PA, which I neglected three times. Like, I was like your boy Jonah, just trying to run. Okay? And when I did it, people were like, God would never send you there. Like, you're, you're being foolish. You're just being a dumb 19-year-old kid. Like, I had all these things that ironically came from people who claimed to love Jesus. But the interesting thing was, like, who were, like, the person, and she's going to love being uh, called out real quick, but my mom. I went to my mom, hey, mom, I think God wants me to move to PA. And her response, I'll never forget, it was just like, well, if he's calling you, I'm not, one of, I'm not the one to stop you. Who, who am I to stop you if God's calling you? Yes. Okay. So it's my mom's fault I'm here, really. Is that the, what I, <laughs> but she had an understanding of, like, no, your kingdom come. Which means that, uh, once again, I think my mom's heart was, like, probably all kinds of wrestling, right? It's not she's like, fine, get out of here, kid. No, like, but she's like, at the end of the day, regardless of how I feel or what I want or what's going on, if God's doing it, who am I to stop you? That's what it means to pray that his kingdom would come. Third thing, pray that God's will would be our top priority. It says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is where we talk about, we're praying that heaven and earth would meet. Now, now once again, that can sound spiritual and lofty and all kinds of great, and we could write a worship song about it, but what does it mean? No, we're praying that the way in which the heavens declare and see God as holy, righteous, and authoritative, that that would actually come to earth and it would touch and it would change things. So like the angels ain't got no problem with viewing God as holy, holy. Sometimes we do, right? The angels have no problem saying, hey, your will, God. Like, I don't know anything other than your will. That's what I want. It's saying that, that that reality from heaven would touch here on earth and it would make a difference. It's that his will would become our top priority. Not our wills or our wants or our ways, but his. Now, let me just say this. This will clash with you. This will clash with the world. This will clash with your flesh. But it's saying, no, God, your will be done. And, and, and if you're wondering, like, what does this look like? Jesus. It's not just like a spiritual band-aid. No, seriously, in the garden, Jesus, before he goes to the cross, he's in there and he's sweating blood. Like Jesus is beginning to experience the weight that's coming because he, he's God, he knows what's coming to him. And in there he says, God, Father, if there's any way. Like he, by the way, he knows what has to be done. He helps set the plan into motion. And yet he's saying, God, if there's any other way, Dad, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. Love this image of prayer because talk about not giving lip service and giving heart service. Jesus does this, right? He's in the garden. He's like, God, if there's any other way, which kind of seems to conflict, right? Well, you already know. No, Jesus is just pouring his heart out. But your will be done. And from that point on, he's, he's pretty much silent because he's, he's saying, all right, God, I'm yours. Your, your will, Father, is my top priority. You see Jesus constantly throughout the Gospels disappointing people left and right. Why? Because he's not there to do what they want. He's there to do his Father's business. Always. And he has to constantly remind them, hey, I'm not, I'm not yours. Like, I'm my dad's. It's not time yet. Don't, don't put me up on a pedestal yet. It's coming. Like, I'm, it, my, my kingdom is coming. Like, my throne is up in heaven, not here. So he's constantly, like, getting their focus back on the Father's will be done. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because I'm so attached to his will that like, it's hard to differentiate between the two of us. Do we have that mentality? That your will be done. Because that's, that's what Jesus is saying for us, that we would pray in such a way that we would say that your will would be done, which means, like practically for us, that you have to say no to your flesh. You have to say no to your desires. You have to say no to the enticements of the world. And we're going to get there later in a little bit. But it's saying that no matter what happens to us, that God's will would be done. Jesus was saying in the garden, knowing that the cross was coming, knowing that the whips were coming, the crown was coming, that the nails would be pierced. He knew that was coming and still said, your will be done. So this means for us, it's not your will be done as long as I get out like unharmed. No, it's your will be done at all costs. But, but check this out. See, because this can sound like daunting and, and audacious and like a heavy burden, but yet Jesus says things like, uh, my yoke is easy and light. And so here's the good news in this is that God's will and our greatest good are the exact same thing. Did you hear me? Like God's will and your good, your greatest good, 
Not your limited perspective of your good. I'm talking eternal, heavenly good. Those are the exact same thing. They're not kind of similar. They're not like, no, they're attached at the hip and they ain't separating. His glory, your good are the same thing. That's why you can take hope. And that's why you can trust that even if things get hard and even if your flesh starts to scream or even if that temptation gets a little bit heavier, that God is still wanting what's best for you. And all things work together for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That means you can endure hard things, not get a, a new uh, kind of a sports car, right? Or, or you can get a bonus check or whatever it is that's kind of lighthearted and fleeting. No, it's meaning that you can endure hard things in this life. Because they're coming. Pray that the Lord's will would be our top priority at all costs. Really, part of how your faith is here, you want to talk about that legacy we're a part of? It's because countless people gladly gave their lives for our king. Stories of someone walking to the gallows and their wife just clapping and applauding and saying, you can take his head, but you can't sever the real head he has in Jesus. You can burn me at the stake, but you're just refining me for my king. Like people who are sharing the gospel as their heads get lobbed off. Like, I mean, that's the kind of, I can endure this, your will be done. And so as the world seemingly getting darker, we just are allowing that light to shine a little bit brighter, right? So I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just trying to help you see the reality of why you're here today is because there's a legacy of people who said this, your will be done, and I mean your will be done. So let us be a people who are dangerous enough to pray that for the sake of King Jesus. Fourth thing, pray that God would meet our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. We pray as daily ongoing dependence on our Father. So this is kind of starting to shift out of seeing, seeing God, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, God, help me. But even in this, you're, you're declaring that God is the one who can actually take care of you. We pray as a daily ongoing dependence on our Father. I love that it says, this day our daily bread. In case we missed it the first day, daily, right? Because we tend to kind of get so worried about what's going on then, or I'm so stuck in the past, or like, I'm not saying don't pray for stuff in the future. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think Jesus is trying to say, hey, listen. And he says in other places, like, tomorrow's got enough worries. Like, we'll get there, but let's focus here. Because you get so focused on the future that you miss the present, right? And so he's saying, hey, ongoing daily dependence. We're seeing God as the only one who has everything we need. He's our provider. This is acknowledging God as provider. So, you know what? Like, and I don't want to make light of your situation, but if you feel in over your head right now, like you're in a good spot to actually put your dependence back on him. God, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to get through this week. That's fine. You're going to get through today. Let's get there. Let's focus there. And it's, it's actually, I've been in situations where it's like, it can get really overwhelming and almost paralyzing when you begin to analyze, oh snap, this needs to happen so that can happen so I don't have to go into this. And yet what happens is God's like, hey, shh, 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 shh. That's cute. Just come here. <laughs> come here. And you begin, like, I'm not saying the whole circumstance and situation change, which, by the way, God often does that. It's amazing, right? But here's what does happen. He pulls me into his loving arms, and he begins to say, hey, it's fine. I got you. And my soul's at ease because my soul wasn't at ease. And then regardless of what happens, I'm ready to receive it and ready to glorify God in it, even if it means I have to be made a fool of or it doesn't go my way. It's the beauty of the gospel is that it sets our soul at ease and God is going to provide for us daily, which means practically, then we're, this, is, this is actually, this prayer, it can seem less spiritual than the other ones that we just mentioned. It's actually incredibly spiritual because what you're doing is you're committing to dying to self-reliance. When you're praying that God would give you this daily bread, you're saying death to my own self. Yes. Death to my, this is death really to the way of the world. Because here's the reality, you were made to be needy. Some of you need to hear that today. It's not a sin to be needy. You're actually operating in the way you were made and, and built. You're hardwired in your DNA to be a needy person. You're not made to be independent. This world would tell you you're insufficient if you're not independent. That if you don't have X amount of dollars in your bank by that certain age, or you don't have all these other things that help the world see you're just this awesome one, you know, person. It's not who you're made to be. You're made to be dependent. You're made to be needy. The problem, here's where sin enters in. I want to read this so I don't get it wrong. What becomes sin is when you turn to anything but God to meet that need, including within yourself. That's the sin. It's not being needy. It's taking your need and going elsewhere. And, 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 I, and I say this this kind of way all the time. Like we've Disney-fied it, right? And said like, just follow your heart. 
you do you. All the princesses are kind of moving in the trajectory of not needing no man, right? And so they just go out and like Moana, Moana doesn't need Maui. Maui kind of kind of screws it up. Like Maui just, you know, Moana comes in and saves the day. And like, it's kind of funny, right? But the reality is we get this picture of like, as long as you believe and as long as you try hard enough, you'll get there. And what God wants us to see is no, all that getting there, all that trying hard and doing it on your own is going to get you is falling flat on your face. So that you actually realize you need his mercy and his grace to overwhelm you. <laughs> Let Disney preach to you one time. And realize your need for a savior. So this is what you do. You ask God to give you what you need. Ask him to make you aware of what you need. Because some of us aren't even there yet, right? If we're honest, give us this day our daily bread. Like the idea of this prayer is not that you just recite it. It's to be a template for you. In other words, you need to put your own words in here your own personal situations and scenarios. But some of us may, not, may be like, God, I don't even know what I need. So that's where you start. God, I don't know what I need. That's a prayer. God, help me see and be aware of what I need. And he would love to answer that for you, by the way. So it's not just what you think you need either. It's what you actually need. God will provide it. And we can be confident in asking him to do what he's really good at doing, which is providing everything you need everything you need. Now, a few more. Pray that we experience God's forgiveness as we forgive others. This is the hard one. One of the hard ones. I don't know if I ever noticed this as I read through the Lord's Prayer this uh, time around, but li listen, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So there is a clear connection between us being forgiven and actually forgiving other people. Like, th there's actually an assumption I think we can make that Jesus is saying if one's not happening, the other one won't. In fact, we clarify that later on in, the, in verses 14 and 15. But I want to bring some clarity to, to this because I think my tendency was to read this and be like, oh, snap, if I'm not doing good at forgiving, like, am I going to make it in? Is God going to forgive me in the end? Am I going to really be a Christian? Like, maybe, maybe, you re, maybe, maybe I'm the only weird one that read it that way. But when I read it, I'm just like, so if I don't forgive others, then my debts aren't going to be forgiven. Well, I love what the ESV study Bible, so if you have one, this, I just pulled this right from there. Uh, the kind of commentary on this verse. It says, forgive us our debts does not mean that believers need to ask daily for justification since believers are justified forever from the moment of initial saving faith. So that's good. So, so Jesus isn't talking about like you getting saved every single day or every single moment in the sense of, of what we may think about. It is being saved from ourselves and from sin uh, as far as it working out in us, but as far as like being right with God, like that's, that's good the moment we put our faith in Jesus. Rather, this prayer is for the restoration of personal fellowship with God when fellowship has been hindered by sin. Those who have received such forgiveness are so moved with gratitude towards God that they also eagerly forgive those who are debtors to them. So here's kind of the takeaway from that statement or from this phrase or this verse. Your fellowship with God can actually be hindered based on your sin. I don't know, this may... That was somewhat like, God, that hit me a little bit, right? I knew that and, and I even have taught that, but like think about what Jesus is saying here is that, that like our personal intimate fellowship with God would not be tainted or interrupted by stuff. And so it's saying that your fellowship with God can be hindered based on your sin. And I just feel like the Lord this morning is saying, maybe that's where some of us are. Right now, I'm not saying like God, you know, kind of struck me with lightning and said something right now, but I'm just thinking like, as I was prepping this, I'm like, oof. I can be there at times. Like I've been there before and I know I'm saved. I know God loves me, but I just feel like he's so far away. It's not because he's gone anywhere. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm way over here. I haven't moved a muscle. <laughs> you just keep sprinting from me. <laughs> like, and, and here's what we need to see this morning. Some of us might be here. This, is, this might be why like worship feels stale to you. This might be why you can come to church and you hear people like getting in, in, into and about and you just feel like you're in a whole other world. This may be why, like, when you go to pray, you're like, I don't really see the point, but I'll do it because I'm a Christian. This may be why you're not feeling connected to God. You know he loves you, you know you're a Christian, you believe what the book tells you, but yet you just feel distant. And maybe that's because there's sin there. And, and I'm not saying it's this even willful decision you made to just go and blaspheme God, but maybe there's some subtle way you've been believing or some subtle lie you're let creeping in or, or a lack of dependence on him that has kind of distanced you from him. And man, this morning, God wants to just give you the invitation. Hey, come home. Come home. 
Like, uh, you still got your room. I haven't rearranged the furniture. I didn't make it a home gym. Like, it's still yours. <laughs> Come home. Come home. So here's the question for you. Will you walk in repentance today and get out of that? Like me, God, God is gracious enough to allow me to speak these words over you today so you hear them, they hit your heart, and you actually walk in repentance. That's the beauty of the gospel. Will you walk in repentance today and get out of that? Because, and would you really experience the forgiveness that's already been purchased for you on the cross? Like Jesus already paid for this. It's not like you have to go through like all the motions again. No, it's yours. If you're a Christian in here and you're, you just feel distant, like that's what the cross was all about. We talked about it last week that it's not only just the bridge to get us right with God, but it's a sledgehammer to knock down anything in the way from between us and other people, right? And so it's that, bra that, that bridge and that, that sledgehammer that actually moves us and compels us to get closer to him. The question is, will you take a step of repentance today? And here's the proof. Here, here's what this text is really telling us, that the proof that you're really walking in forgiveness, the forgiveness that God has purchased for you, is that you're willing to forgive other people. So if you're wondering, like, I don't know if I really feel forgiven, well, then here's the question. How are you doing at forgiving other people? How's that bitterness going? <laughs> How's that, that anger, that frustration when you think of that person? When I said that person, you got a face in your head, right? Like, how are you doing at forgiving them? Because if you aren't really receiving the forgiveness God has for you, it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to forgive other people. And so that's a way you can know, man, if I'm still harboring this bitterness or this frustration, like, don't start there. Start with you and God. Hey, God, am I really receiving all that you have for me? Am I really taking on this blood that you actually shed for me? Am I really operating in this intimacy that I can have now because of what Jesus has done for me? The fact the Holy Spirit lives in me, am I tapping into that reality? And then I just believe that domino effects will start to happen when you get right with God relationally, then all those dominoes of bitterness and unforgiveness towards other people are just going to trickle down. Doesn't mean it's going to be all sunshine and rainbows. In fact, it may frustrate those people as you're like, I forgive you. Well, no, I want you to harbor bitterness to me. I want to have a hold on you. I want to have control over you. That's demonic. Let that go. Man, man just, I, I forgive you. No, genuinely, I forgive you. And that's going to really tick some people off. And you're just like, no, nah, you're good. Like, I, I'm not going to let you control me by like, me holding on to this bitterness anymore. Maybe some of us need to walk in that this morning. It's not easy, by the way, but it is possible. Because when you realize how much you've been forgiven, it puts into perspective what other people have done for you or to you. I even have in my notes, in all caps, be sensitive. That's what I wrote for myself here. Some of us have gone through unspeakable things. Some of us have been victims. Some of us have been abused. Some of us have been mistreated. Some of us have actually had people look at us and say that we don't have value, dignity, and worth. And so they, they just literally walked all over us. Or maybe did much more than just walked all over us. And so when I say things like, well, you, you know, just look at the cross and Jesus forgives you. And so just forgive them. That can seem insensitive and hard to hear. But I want you to hear me say that, like, I'm not, I'm not saying short circuit any of that. I'm actually saying the cross allows you to take that head on. And that Jesus, the one who was ridiculed, mocked, and beaten, and spit upon, and misunderstood, the one who became sin, did so so that you could actually forgive those who've absolutely mishandled you, who have not seen you as a human and have treated you like an animal. So I just want to, just want to say this morning, like if that's happened to you, I'm not, I'm not saying just be Christian and be, be nice and godly. No, I'm saying like allow Jesus to take your hand and walk through that hard pain. And you want to know like how deep the gospel really goes? It goes there. It goes into that mess, into that thick, and that brokenness and says, hey, let me get you out of that. Like I, I'm serious when I said I beat death and all the things that come with it. Will you allow him to take your hand and walk you out of that mess so that you can actually really Experience the forgiveness that God has for you and then lavish it out on other people. See, Jesus rose to forgive you, but he also rose so that you would forgive other people. We can short sight the gospel when we say Jesus died for me, he rose again for me so I can be right with him. That is so true, so true. And yet that's not the fullness of the gospel. The fullness of the gospel says yes and. And I died to get you right with other people too. I died so that, that that brokenness, that bondage, that chain, that abuse, that addiction, whatever it is, doesn't have to stay on you anymore. 
Like I, you can actually let that thing go. Not only are you good with God, but you can be good with them. And you can actually be a light, a free person who can run with endurance and get off the weights and the sins that so easily entangle. Like you can really go after him. I mean, some of us are, are, are holding on chains and weights this morning that aren't intended for us. The cross broke. And we've been somehow convinced that we just have to put them back on so we look more spiritual. And God said, my, my children run light and free. Like I got green pastures for you to lie down in that are going to be hard to lie down in when you got chains on. You just get them off. Will you let them do it today? Pray that God's power over evil would be lived out. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, so here, it's kind of a twofold thing here. It's lead us away from the things that could tempt us to sin. So check this out. There's a, I love the flow of this. Because he, he says right here, I want you to actually walk in the forgiveness I have for you and forgive other people and not lead you back into sin. Not lead you back to a place where you could be unforgiving again. No, I want to keep you out of that track record. Like I want to progress you in the right direction, not get you to take, take like two steps forward and three steps back. No, God doesn't operate that way. He's not wanting that for you. He wants you to move forward constantly. And so he says, like, don't lead me into temptation. So lead us away from things that could tempt us to sin. Now, we, we could pray that and kind of be just somewhat vague, like, God, you know, help me not to sin today. Or help me not be tempted by, you know, sin today. I would encourage you, though, if you know what tempts you, name it. Now, I'm not saying that you need, necessarily need to do that publicly here. Although if the Lord's leading you to do that, like, trust the Spirit. But there may be some things that you need to, that, that you're tempted by that aren't appropriate for you to share here, so don't share them. But when it's you and the Lord, name it. Because one, he already knows. Like sometimes we feel like, oh, it's going to be weird if I share what's tempting to, to God. It's like, hello, I, I literally, I nailed it to the cross and I've been navigating it in your whole life. Like, hey, I, like don't try to hide it from me. You can't hide it. But name it. And here's why you need to name it so that you can bring it into the light and get accountability and, and fight to avoid it. Like, like right now, if I tell you, like, hey, I, I'm, I'm a compulsive liar and I struggle with lying. You know what I've just done? A couple things. One, I brought it to the light. Now, the Bible tells us that when we do that, the devil has lost a grip. So one, you just punch the devil in the face. So that's cool. But two, which is almost even better, is that now I've brought you in to be my accountability. So when I say some stuff that you know is not true, you're not obligated to hold me accountable. Hey, bro, you said you're a compulsive liar, and you said yesterday you were going to go there, but you went there. Hmm. I love you. We can't lie. Like, that, that's what it does. It brings it to the light so you can actually get help. Not be judged or ridiculed or made fun of or even feel like you're not alone anymore. That's, that's like, important that you don't feel judged, important that you don't feel alone, but it's to really get you help. It's to get that thing off of you. It's to lead you away from that temptation. But then it says, but deliver us from evil. So it's saying, don't lead us this direction and get this other thing off of us. It says, overpower and overthrow the evil that is around us. So, so this prayer is like this war cry, this violent war cry that deliver us from evil. Like get it away, get it off, get it, get it somewhere else. Like get it back to hell where it belongs. And, and so it's this idea that our strongholds, our lies, our sinful habits things that have happened to us, things that we're participating in, whatever you could fill in the blank with, that that evil, we'd be delivered from it. Now the cross delivers us from it as far as our relationship with God, but the practical implications of it on us, man, as we pray that the spirit would move us in ways that the evil around us begins to flee. And we say it here all the time, the beauty of the gospel means you don't have to choose sin anymore. You don't. I'm not saying you're not going to wrestle or struggle with it. I'm just saying like you can look sin in the face and say, no, thank you. Like, I really don't want you anymore. Like, I really want the things of God. Like, you can say that, not in, your, in and of yourself, but the spirit in you can say it. And he wants to say it. Will you let him say it? Praying with trust in the midst of pure evil. This is like what makes Christians so crazy because we can look evil in the face and not uh, tweet about it or pay, post on Facebook or hope a politician comes in and saves the day. No, we can stand here and say, hey, in the midst of pure evil, I'm not looking for politics to save me. I'm looking for Jesus to save me. I'm looking for Jesus to come in and do something about this. And what a beautiful thing we can hold on to. It says that we will be delivered from this evil and we can then push that evil back. Like you can push evil back. You can actually tell it to leave. 
You can say, hey, no, we're not going to tolerate your presence here anymore. Like, we're not just going to let you kick us around like a, 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 foot, like a soccer ball. We're not going to let you do that with us. We're going to start kicking you around like a soccer ball. That's how this is going to work. <laughs> and so literally, you have that authority and power now. And so Jesus is telling us in this prayer, pray like that. Pray with veracity. Pray with intensity. Pray like with warlike violence towards the enemy. And so then here, here's the question. How do we push back evil? Because if you're like me, you get like all riled up and like, I'm just ready to go to hell and beat the devil. Like, I'm ready. Like, I'm not even going to let him get out. I'm going to go there and I'm going to get him. Like, that's how you can get kind of like jacked up, right? I don't know if it's the coffee talking or what. But <laughs> that's where I get to this prayer. But check it out. Because here, here's how Jesus tells us. He's like, all right, you want to go? You want to fight? I'll let you fight. Forgive. Look, look at 14 and 15. <laughs> For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So Jesus, so awesome and beautiful, he leads us to the edge of this place of like, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to get after it. He says, all right, Forgive. You want to disrupt the darkness? You, you want to make havoc for the enemy? You want to frustrate his plans and purposes? Start forgiving. Start forgiving. And, and basically what he's telling us is like, start receiving forgiveness. Because man, once you start to receive the grace and mercy of God and let it lavish over you and quit making up reasons why you're not worthy of receiving grace, because that's the whole point. I think Jesus just finds it funny. He's like, well, I don't deserve it. Duh. <laughs> like, he's like, that's why I did it. Because <laughs> if you could figure it out another way, I'd have let you, but you couldn't. So I came in and I saved the day. But will you just receive that mercy and that grace and let it lavish over you and not make excuses or not try to hinder it or not like try to control it, just let God do it over you? You know what's going to happen? You're going to get so overwhelmed, literally, that it leads you and compels you to start forgiving other people. It's going to help you see that God is really good that hell is really real, that grace is really beautiful, that time is really short, and that the things of this world are fleeting and failing, and, and yet God is giving us an eternal hope. When you allow the grace and mercy to wash over you, it actually begins to lead you to the place of fighting by forgiving. That's how we wage war. It's praying with a forgiving spirit. And, and he says it. I mean, Jesus, I love it. He doesn't parse words. He says, basically, if you give it, then you'll receive it, and if you don't, then you won't. It's not like, oh, is there some mysterious meaning? Do we have to decode this? No, it's like very simple. No, if you, if you give grace and mercy to people, you're going to receive grace and mercy. If you don't, you're not going to. And, and Jesus is really saying to us here, if you've actually experienced it, you can't help but give it. And if you're not giving it, it's because you need to first receive it. And this is not a works-based salvation. It's, it's again, he's talking about what he was talking about in verse 12, that this is a relational unity and fellowship with God. If you want to feel close and intimate with God again, start receiving the forgiveness He's given you. And then give it away to other people. Because there's something beautiful that happens when we choose to forgive other people that not only gets us right with each other, right? But then it gets God closer or gets us closer to the heart of God. You're not just moving towards people, you're moving upwards towards His heart. And this is only possible with Holy Spirit. So we prayed in the beginning that Holy Spirit would, would devote us, man. Holy Spirit would lead us. You cannot forgive other people in and of yourself. Stop trying. Or, or maybe we've believed the, believed the lie. Well, I can't. How, how can I receive God's forgiveness if I can't forgive myself? I love you enough to tell you, who cares if you forgive yourself? Like if God forgives you, who are you to not forgive you? <laughs> and what's crazy is when you actually let God's forgiveness forgive you, then you can forgive yourself. Because you're, you realize like, if God could say, hey, I, I love you and I forgive you, then, well, I've offended God way more than I've offended myself. So you just let the grace and mercy wash over you and it gets all that mess out of the way. And it gives you clarity and sight and, and a lightness about you to, to run for the kingdom. But it's only possible with the Holy Spirit. So this is, to pray with a forgiving spirit means to pray in light of God's grace and mercy towards us. That's what it, that's what it means. You're praying with the perspective that, that God has lavished and poured out grace and mercy upon you. And if you're wondering how that is even possible, it's the gospel. We see it most fully in the gospel that God 
in eternity past that I, I'm going to put my glory on display in a way that's going to be radical and crazy to the world. And I'm going to create man in my image because I am so in love with who I am that I want to give myself away to other people. Because I'm so good, I don't want to just keep it to myself. I want to create things, and at the crescendo of my creation, I want to make people. And those people, I want to have intimacy and relationship with me, and yet, I know they're going to mess it up. It, the garden didn't surprise God, and so when sin entered in, God wasn't like, oh no, what do we do now? He says, no, I'm going to send someone who's going to crush your head, and you might bruise his heel. And so we see the fracture and brokenness all throughout humanity, and yet sign after sign after sign is pointing to the one who would come. Prayer after prayer of begging for the Messiah to come and, and heaven met earth when Jesus was born. And Jesus lives this life of perfection where he's flipping the world upside down and he's reminding them of the kingdom of God coming. And he's saying again, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. I'm here to do my father's will. See, Jesus could pray this prayer with integrity and teach us to do it because this was his life motto. And as he lived this life of perfection, it really frustrated some people who had ulterior motives and agendas that weren't of God, and so they actually accused him of being a criminal, a blasphemer. And they nailed him to a cross. And before that, they, they beat him beyond recognition and mocked him and said, this is the king of the Jews. And as he hung there, and as he was bleeding, and as he was beaten beyond recognition, exposed naked for the world to see, he was crying out, I love you, I love you. This is what grace and mercy look like. Even when you can't forgive yourself, I'm here to forgive you. And he breathed his last, last breath and he screamed out, and it is finished. And he died. And he stayed buried for three days and then he cheated death and he rose again. And he said, devil, you have no more grip. You have no more sting. And as he rose out, I just believe in the heavens. Once again, don't take this as scriptural, but, but I just think the angels are like, hey, death, where are you at? Oh, sin, where is your sting? That's all you got. Look at our risen king. He's here, he's alive, and, and he's a force to be reckoned with. Let him usher in grace and mercy this morning. See, we will be devoted to prayer when we taste God's grace. Have you tasted it this morning? Maybe you're in here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, and that's why you might be miserable. And God's just saying, hey, you don't have to choose that anymore. Choose me. Amen. Will you give your life to Jesus today? And if you're interested in wanting to do that, like we'll walk you through how to do that. Come talk to me. But maybe you're in here this morning and you are a Christian and you feel like you're wrestling and you're harboring unforgiveness and bitterness. And I'm just here to tell you today, you don't have to hold that either. And you can feel close again. You can feel intimate with God again. That's possible for you. Will you walk and operate in repentance? We will, we will be devoted to prayer when we taste God's grace. Will you taste today, Zeal Church? Mm -hmm.